Hello, nerds and Netflix reboots. My name is TV Sky, and if you've been on the internet for the past couple of days, you might have been all of a sudden made aware that there is a She-Ra Princess of Power reboot coming out on Netflix sometime this fall. I think it's going to be sometime in October. Um, it was announced with a few teaser images and, a, and an interview with the showrunner being put online, and the internet kind of went wild for it. Like, there was a hell of a lot of reactions and a hell of a lot of chatter about it, and consequently, I want to get in my two cents about the show and also about a few other things. But before we get into any commentary, any opinion making, let's just have a look at the total num sum of information that is available about this new show right now. Like, just all, everything is possible to know about it. Let's just have a quick recap of it. And the first thing is possible to know about it is that this is one of the key pieces of art that was released for it. This is a poster image of some kind. Like, it's not a still from inside any of the episodes. It's a poster image. It's some kind of key um, art piece. It might be the one that they're going to use um, on the Netflix website. They're going to slap the logo and the title on. On it and that'll be the one you click on in order to watch the show that's certainly kind of the the, the formatting and the aspect ratio kind of makes it look like that to me but it's not a still from one from one of the episodes the next four images however are stills from within episodes as far as i can tell one of she-ra herself standing in her hero pose you know staring confidently ahead as she's about to overcome whatever challenge has been stood in her way then we have one of a character on the left called katra i do believe and she-ra uh, herself on the right, or rather Adora, which is her name when she's not using her magical princess power. They're kind of just hanging out together and being unhappy, it looks like. Then we have uh, on the left Glimmer, who is, I believe, is a sorceress of some kind. In the middle, we have a dude called Bo, who is called Bo because he uses a bow. Can't really claim that 80s cartoons were very creative about the naming. And then finally, we have a piece of, uh, I think it might be an establishing shot from one of the episodes. It might be a frame, like, kind of establishing the environment. But here it serves a purpose as a piece of concept art, kind of outlining the visual style of the show and the aesthetic and, uh, and the use of color palette that's going to be going on in the environments in the show. That's it for the images. The interview we have here is uh, with the showrunner Noelle Stevenson, who is a uh, rather successful graphic novel writer and creator. Um, she has created a bunch of like Nimona and Lumberjanes and another one. I can't remember the, the name of right, but I've read Lumberjanes. It's really honestly quite good. And I think she won an Eisner for that. So I recommend that if you want to check out some of her work, that's a good place to go. Anyway, in this interview, which is mostly about the creator and the story of the show, uh, there is a little snippet where she kind of outlines the basic plot of the series as it's going to play out. So I thought since it's very brief, we're just going to read through it together. So, like in the original 1985 series, our protagonist, Adora, was kidnapped as a baby and raised with the evil Horde, only to discover her true identity later in life. We've really started from the same starting point where the original show started from, because Adora has such a great backstory, Stevenson says. She's separated from her family as a baby, she's sent to another planet, she's adopted by the villain Overlord and raised by him in this evil army. She's been raised to believe that the villains are doing the right thing and that the princesses are the evil ones, and so we follow her as she has this crisis of faith. She's been sheltered her whole life, and as she starts to experience the world, she realizes that there's more to this than she knew. That maybe there's a reason they were called the Evil Horde, Stevenson laughs, that maybe they were evil. As she discovers more about the world, Adora also has to learn how to live up to the She-Ra identity. As She-Ra, she doesn't know how to act. This is all new to her, and it's a little clumsy at first. It's like an uncomfortable suit. She's like, okay, here I am. I'm very famous, I'm, or, or I'm very glamorous, I'm very strong. People are looking up to me because I'm very tall. And that's it. That is that is the sum total of all the knowledge that it is as the time of at the time of this recording. It's the sum total of all the knowledge that it's possible to have about the um, She-Ra reboot. So, what do I think of it? I don't know, I think it looks fine. Looks okay. I don't know, nothing exciting. Because, um, like, we have some screenshots and a brief plot summary, which, like, we have a coming-of-age story of a young woman who's trying to find her identity in the world and, you know, learn to live up to the responsibilities of having her powers, which is, like... Kind of the same thing that happened with The Legend of Korra, and kind of also the same basic plot structure that happens in Steven Universe, except, you know, boy instead of a girl. And the same kind of plot structure that you find in a lot of children's entertainment, which it's a popular one, and it doesn't really say that much about the show itself, because it doesn't really matter. The premise isn't nearly as important as the execution, and we don't really know a lot about the execution. I think visually, 
there's a couple of interesting things going on. First of all, it's a DreamWorks production. Um, DreamWorks are the animation studio behind this, and they are a venerable uh, animation studio. They have a lot of experience. They have a lot of very good people working there. They have a lot of resources. So one would assume that it's gonna be a fairly good looking show. Like it's it's pro the animation is probably gonna be a fairly decent quality. I don't think it's gonna blow anyone's mind, but it's certainly gonna be at least like up to the standard of stuff like um, Voltron, which was also in a, a Netflix production, and and stuff like that. It's gonna be up to the standards of modern children's cartoons. And looking at the aesthetics, yeah, there's actually it looks fairly appealing. Like. Um, Something that, that, that happens with modern cartoons especially, because they're all digitally produced, is that they don't have the same kind of texture that old style cartoons have. Like one of, one of the great anime of, the, of, of this, uh, these past couple of seasons is Megalobox, which is an anime that is deliberately a very strong throwback to the hand-drawn style of like the 80s and 90s. And that's something I was very pleased to see because there is a kind of granular textured grungy feel that you get in that style of animation that has just kind of been lost in with the advent of modern digital technologies. Now with Megalobox, I don't know if that's something that they achieve by like digital trickery or whatever, but it's something that works really well, and looking at the stills from the show just here in my web browser, and I, this might be image compression because it's like JPEGs that are put on the internet, but the sense I kind of get from looking at them is that there is actually kind of a lot of texture going on here. Like I can see a lot of what looks like a paper texture kind of overlaid on the background and the same thing on the characters. And for me, it gives it this wonderful kind of semi-analog look that reminds me of nothing so much as um, um, 80s and 90s anime, actually. I, it it kind of has that same feel of, of that hand-drawn, handcrafted thing. Like It's all digital. Let's be clear about that. It's, it's all digitally created, but they kind of, they seem to be going as, and I can also see that in the background, you can see the very hand-painted style going on with the railings that the two characters are interacting with, um, as well as the, you know, the background here. They're going for a much more textured, manual-looking style, at least as far as I can tell, and I kind of like that. Like, I've really missed the, the granular sensation of hand-drawn, like, uh, analog hand-drawn art that really hasn't been present in children's cartoons for a long time. Whether that's going to be present in the, in the final show when we have like 1080p Blu-ray quality images on screen, I don't know, but you know, here's hoping. And uh, another thing that, that kind of puts me in mind of like 80s and 90s anime is just the general aesthetic of the character designs. It also har uh, pays a lot of homage, or at least it owes a lot of visual debt to shows like Avatar and The Legend of Korra and uh, what's the other one? One more I was thinking about. Oh, it doesn't really matter, um, because it it kind of it kind of runs on that same visual style for the faces in particular, um, which is something that it's a style that's well known. It's a style that a lot of people are very comfortable working with. It's a style that's well suited for animation. Like it's the same thing with like the reason a lot of anime characters tend to look very similar is pretty much like these are styles that have been workshopped and that work really well for an animation process, which is always going to be about budget versus time. Um, so. I suspect that's pretty much it. And it does, unfortunately, lend to a thing where the characters' faces, as far as I can tell, like, from these very few screenshots, like, there's probably a lot more characters in the show, but where the characters' bodies and shapes and faces are not quite as, as you know, not quite as outrageous as you might like, or as I might like, not you might like, I might like. I have a thing where I really like when there's really strong visual distinction with the bodies of characters in cartoon shows. It's not so much here. Um, it's it's kind of got a standard hero show aesthetic. There's also a lot of Sailor Moon aesthetic going on here, I think. I mean, and certainly in terms of what she looks like when she transforms into the warrior form. Like with the skirt and, and so the kind of the... the hot pants or whatever you might call them and the chest piece and the and the things on the sh on the shoulders like that really has a lot of the sailor moon aesthetic to me like it really looks like a magical girl transformation which is kind of also basically what both he-man and she-ra really are as stories they are they are they're magical girl stories as it were even though you know maybe adam would resent that characterization i don't know and that's, yeah, that's pretty cool. Like a Western produced magical girl show. That sounds pretty cool to me. I'd be down for that. Um, but yeah, I mean, maybe once the show is released, it's boring. Maybe there's no storyline. Maybe the characters are not interesting. Maybe it goes nowhere. Maybe it doesn't have an interesting plot. Maybe it's just kind of jogging in place or have terrible animation and bad action scenes. 
I don't know, but from the looks of it, the information that I have so far tells me that this is going to be a perfectly decent children's cartoon show. And at this point, I've managed to fill 10 minutes with, you know, kind of chatting and analyzing. Oh, by the way, one thing I wanted to touch on, the aesthetic that they've got going on here for the environments and the backgrounds, it reminds me a heck of a lot of, like, um, 50s and 60s pulp sci-fi novels. Like, the the kind of thing that would be named as sort of the, the secret civilization of Mars or or whatever. Like, this, this very bulgy kind of high concept uh, fantasy style is also a little bit reminiscent of something uh, like uh, you'd see in, in 1970s sci-fi. Uh, with a lot of crystal and magic stuff going on. There's a lot of interesting influences there that kind of harken back to the theoretical sci-fi roots that are that are sort of at the heart of, of, of both He-Man and She-Ra. Anyway, that's not all I wanted to talk about, because if you know about the She-Ra animated series that's coming to Netflix, you also know about the air quotes backlash. Now, I hesitate to really call it backlash because it's like... <sighs> So like, okay, so let's start from here. Every time there's a reboot, something is going to be lost. That is in the nature of the beast. Like when a new creative team takes over on a show or a concept, they bring their own ideas and they they will not care about the same exact things that the original showrunners cared about. It happens with Star Wars. It happens with Star Trek. It happens with every popular nerd franchise that runs for a long time. It has happened with every single Marvel character that has ever existed, every single DC character. When there's a reboot, when there is a new storyteller who takes over, some changes happen because storytellers care about different things. They prioritize different things and that always kind of sucks a little bit like if, if you're someone who loves a particular ip or a property or a cartoon or a franchise or whatever it may be and a new person takes over what's inevitably going to happen is that something about that franchise that you care about that's really deeply important to you that really matters to how you see that that franchise is not going to matter in the same way to the new person who takes over. They're not going to care about it in the same way. They're not going to think about it in the same way. And that's when they retcon stuff out. That's when they make changes. And that's when it can feel really bad. Um, and that's that's just something that happens. That's just that's the nature of the beast. And so when things are rebooted, generally speaking, I try to take a relatively charitable attitude towards people who are upset about it because like yeah i mean because it feels like you are having something taken away from you or in the worst case scenario it feels like people are taking over the thing that you love who don't understand it in the correct way because we imagine that the correct way to understand the show is the one that we've got because we're the ones who get it we're the fans it belongs to us kind of except of course it doesn't it, it never belongs to the fans no matter how much marketing people might try to tell you oh we really make the show like with the fans in mind really care about the fans they never do and in fact they shouldn't because that would kind of compromise artistic freedom a lot it always sucks when something is rebooted in a way that you don't like. When some when when some new showrunner comes in and adds a bunch of stuff or takes a bunch of stuff away that that they don't like or that they don't think is relevant, but which is crucial to your enjoyment of the thing. It sucks, and so there's always going to be backlash against reboots and new versions of old things. It's just it's what happens. And usually my policy is to ride it out, let people have their tantrum, let people be upset and angry, and then let them have time to explore the new thing. And usually what's going to happen is they're going to see the good qualities that are being brought to the new thing. And they're going to, okay, I can like those things, even if the old stuff I wanted is no longer here. And things will blow over and settle down. That is not the kind of backlash we're going to be talking about here. The kind of backlash we're talking about here... I mean, there's a, there's your usual suspects, like the really stupid, disgusting, bigoted bullshit comments from the MRA brigade. So it's not like, oh, bro, this is an SJW plot to take over the world with the Illuminati or whatever the fuck it is they believe these days. Jesus Christ, I can't keep track. Like that shit is out there and as annoying and it, it pisses me off when I see it, but I don't care about it that much. The thing that does bother me, the thing I do get annoyed by is the historical revisionism takes that are kind of coming out about this. The historical revisionism takes that posit that the original Shira was somehow a kind of, of celebration of femininity, and it's, a, it's a, kind of a celebration of, you know, a, a 
creativity and storytelling and and celebrating the the female power and stuff and then the new one oh oh they've they've taken away all her womanly charms by not having her tits out anymore and she looks like a boy now and it's too androgynous and it should be much more feminine because she is exclusively about you know celebrating femininity and stuff and that take pisses me off because you know what there has never in the history of ever been a less credible a less or a, a period of time in human history with less artistic credibility in cartoons than the fucking 1980s the 1980s are a period of time where a lot of very interesting very creative concepts for cartoons came out of with a lot of weird wild divergent visual diversity but it's also a time that where cartoons were driven by profound and pervasive cynicism and capitalist exploitation. And I don't mean capitalist exploitation in like from a Marxian, ah, oh, these capitalist pig dogs do not care about like, no, no, no. I mean capitalist in the sense of the thing is it, cartoons being sold and marketed specifically as advertising. In the 1980s, and I've talked about this on the channel before in my uh, video about Ninja Sex Party, in the 1980s, a certain number of regulations were in place um, to protect children from manipulative advertising. That is, there were regulations in place that made it illegal to create cartoon shows or children's entertainment media, or indeed to advertise specifically to children. And these, these were kind of moral panic laws that were about protecting young minds from the predations of uh, unscrupulous businessmen and stuff like that. But they, in the 1980s, with the ascent of the Reagan administration, those regulations were seen as overly restrictive and they were thrown out. And what followed very, very quickly was kind of a gold rush of of, of toy manufacturers and people with an interest in selling products to children rushing in to try and cash in on the newly opened opportunity to create essentially half hour long cartoons that could function as advertising for their products. And this was inspired uh, in part by the success of the merchandising for Star Wars, which had come out in, in the 19, in late, late 1970s and continued into the 1980s, where, where one of the things that the people who are marketing toys around Star Wars figured out was that instead of just creating like a Luke Skywalker doll, and selling that to children and creating like a Han Solo doll and, and selling that to children and some blasters and stuff, they could create a franchise of toys which were meant to be played with together in concert. Because like much of the philosophy of play prior to the 1970s and 1980s was that kids just, you give them a bunch of toys and they'll figure out, like they'll make up their own little stories. And that's very much the Andy from uh, Toy Story approach where you have your Buzz Lightyear toy and you have your Woody, to your Woody the Cowboy toy and you have your Rex the Dinosaur and Mr. Potato Head and you just play with all of them together and you make up your own stories. And that's something that the marketers behind Star Wars figured out but hang on, what if we could tell kids that wouldn't it be much more fun if you could reenact your favorite scene from Star Wars? Wouldn't it be much more fun if you could have Darth Vader and Luke Skywalker and Yoda and Han Solo and the Speeder and the Death Star and an X-Wing and a Y-Wing and an A-Wing and you could all you could reenact all your favorite Star Wars scene? Wouldn't it be cooler if you had all of the toys and you could play with them all together? And that proved to be a phenomenally successful marketing approach. So successful indeed, that when the time came in the 80s that children's cartoons could be used once again for advertising, everyone wanted in on that gold mine. Everyone wanted in on that Star Wars merchandising money. So what was done was that Hasbro and the other toy companies, especially Hasbro uh, was, was a pioneer in this thing, got a bunch of writers together in a room and said, Here's some toys we've got imported from Japan. That was what Hasbro did, specifically with the Transformers. They had these transforming robot toys. They didn't really know what to do with them, so they got a bunch of writers together in a room, gave them all these toys and said, make up some stories about these toys, where there's some good guys, like the Rebellion in Star Wars, and there's some bad guys, like the Empire, and they have to fight each other so that we can sell these toys like in groups to children and tell them that you have to have both sides of the conflict in order to play with them in the correct way and stuff. That's essentially the birth story of Transformers. It really really wasn't, nobody sat there and going, oh, I have a really great idea for this really cool story about these robots that have to disguise themselves. It was a bunch of writers who were like, these toys can transform into cars. Uh, I guess they're aliens or something. I don't know. They're aliens from like a planet and they become cars and they fight the other evil cars who are also jet planes sometimes. It was really very much just kind of a, let's figure out something that fits. And then 
accidentally, it became one of the most popular toy franchises on the entire goddamn Earth. But the point I'm trying to get at here is the 1980s cartoons, Transformers, He-Man, She-Ra, you know, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Street Sharks, well into the 90s, the, all of this was not artistic endeavor. Nobody involved with it, nobody who was funding it, nobody who was creating the character designs gave a crap <laughs> about artistic integrity. Like the artists and the writers and the designers behind them, the creative people behind them tried their best and occasionally they would come up with some gold. Like Transformers has a few good episodes that explore some interesting sci-fi concepts, but ultimately the people who were funding the animation didn't want to fund the anime, like they didn't want to spend a lot of time animating these characters. And so what you get, for instance, with She-Ra is that She-Ra and Glimmer and the blue lady and the pink lady with the wings and the lady over here, essentially just the same character five times, literally the same exact goddamn character, but they change the length of the hair a little bit. They give some different colors and a different, different outfit, but all of the anatomies are the same. And that is a, first of all, it's a toy thing. It's because it's a lot easier to create five toys with the same basic mold and then you put some extra accessories on top of them than it is to create five completely different toys. Like it's a cost cutting measure. It's the entire basis behind, for instance, uh, Barbie dolls is it's the same Barbie doll over and over and over and over and over and over, but we just sell different accessories with her e each and every single time. Exactly the same thing going on here. And it's the same reason why in He-Man, all of the dudes pretty much have exactly the same anatomy, but with different costumes and stuff just kind of plonked on top of them. It's why we have the green Sasquatch and the fucking weird beetle dude, whoever the hell that is, and the dude in the weird suit, the diving thing. And a lot of it was also that toy molds and toy materials would be imported from places like China and Japan and Taiwan. And that it was just kind of easier to make up a story. Like, that's why a lot of these characters look so fucking weird all put together is because a lot of the times they were cobbled together from completely disparate franchises and toy ideas from other countries that toy companies in the West would just kind of import the toys and say, okay, let's put these together and make up some story about them so we can sell them all as some kind of a set. That's also the way that a lot of like modern toy commercials came about. And it's probably part of the reason why this fucking weirdo design is, is, is in, um, uh, is in She-Ra. And that's like, and that's really the thing you have to understand about 1980s cartoons, like the GI Joes and the She-Ra's and all that stuff is no, listen, there was no celebration of feminine power here. There, there, there was no artistic integrity. There was no credibility. Anytime a cartoon like this managed to do something good or interesting happened entirely by accident. This, like, and I, the reason this annoys me, the reason this pisses me off is because after the 1980s toy cartoon boom, we get into the 90s and finally cartoons start to show a little life. The thing I always harken back to is the Batman the Animated Series, one of the first cartoon series that ever managed to start making some interesting, serious, artistic statements, started trying to use the medium to tell interesting stories, which even managed to win an Emmy for the episode Heart of Ice chronicling the rise and fall of Mr. Freeze. That cartoon, that Batman cartoon was greenlit on the basis that if it became a popular cartoon, it would shift a lot of toys and merchandise. That is why Warner Brothers wanted to make it. That is why DC Comics agreed to make it. They wanted to sell toys. And the creators behind Batman the Animated Series had to fight tooth and nail to give the series the level of artistic credibility that it got. And when it became successful, good lord, it became successful. It paved the way for other cartoons like it's Superman. The animated series has some truly spectacular episodes. One of my favorites is um, The Late Mr. Kent, uh, which was animated by a Japanese anime studio called TMS Entertainment, which, which if you ever get a chance to watch it, Superman anime series, The Late Mr. Kent, you need to watch it because it's absolutely gorgeous. But that stuff, the only way they got the budgets to do that stuff. The only way they got companies to front the money and give them the artistic freedom to do these things is because the companies reasoned that so long as the cartoon was popular and so long as they made sure to feature different gadgets and different villains on the various episodes, they would always be able to sell toys of this stuff. Right. And part of the reason why the cartoon medium is not, shall we say, particularly well seen in the modern day, why, why the cartoon medium has for a very long time been saddled with the accusation that it is shallow entertainment for children with no artistic value to its name, something that still haunts cartoons and animation to this day, is this. 
it's this shit right here. It's these cartoons from the 1980s who were shallow, who were full of absolutely nothing, who weren't trying to do anything serious artistically, who were just trying to sell plastic crap with shallow storylines. This is where that stigma comes from. And we spent all of the 90s, all of the 2000s, and well into the 2010s even, trying to get out from under that stigma. The existence of cartoons like Bojack Horseman, like Rick and Morty, like Steven Universe, like the, the Amazing World of Gumball, who might be the most impressive mixed media animation project in modern history. All of these great cartoons, Adventure Time, happened because serious, very hardworking, artistic, creative professionals did a hell of a lot of hard work to escape from under the shadows of this naked, money-grabbing bullshit. And so it pisses me off, like, I'm an, I'm, a, I'm an animation aficionado, I care a lot about animation, I believe very strongly in the power of that medium to tell great stories, and I believe it is grossly underutilized, partly because of that stigma, so to hear people look at this and go, oh, oh, it's such a corruption of the grand legacy of She-Ra. Oh, that wonderful cartoon from my childhood, which taught me so much about the importance of gender equality. And I said, fuck you, just go to hell and back. None of that was in there. Nobody put any of that in there. It's the same goddamn thing with like uh, Thundercats Roar. Like they got so much hate because it's essentially trying to do sort of a lighthearted cartoon Teen Titans go take on Thundercats and people got so upset about it as though original Thundercats had any artistic merit to throw away. Original Thundercats was exactly the same as this and this. It was a toy driven marketing exercise designed to sell plastic crap to children at Christmas. That's all the original Thundercats was and anything good about it happened by accident. Now I should stress, I am a child of the 80s and 90s. I watched these cartoons as a kid. I loved the He-Man cartoons. I bought the plastic crap that they sold me. And if you have a strong affection for these cartoons, if you have a strong affection for, for the, these pieces of media, even though they were cynical cash grabs just trying to sell you shit, if they told you something interesting, if they taught you good lessons, if they gave you good stories, if they helped you understand yourself or build your moral core or just help you develop or just entertain you for a little while, I'm not here saying, oh, you're wrong and stupid and you have bad taste. No, because you're a kid. Like, of course this stuff works on you. You're a kid, it's okay. I'm not here saying that you're stupid or that you're wrong or that you're not allowed to like the old He-Man or the old She-Ra. Like I said, if something has been taken away by the reboot that you really cared about and it's not just She-Ra's freaking tits, that's fine. I'm not talking about you in this instance. But I'm talking about the people who are so profoundly blinded by the glasses of nostalgia that they confuse the thing they liked as a child for something that liked them. Because the old She-Ra cartoon didn't like you. The old She-Ra cartoon didn't particularly care about the audience that much. The old She-Ra cartoon cared that the audience went to the toy store and brought home the plastic crap. And I'm not gonna make any bones about it, like, the new She-Ra cartoon is also hoping to sell a lot of toys and merchandise, the same way that, like, the reason Steven Universe gets to continue existing is because it moves a lot of merchandise, it moves a lot of t-shirts, it moves a lot of posters, it moves a lot of action figures, the same thing goes for Adventure Time, the same thing goes for Rick and Morty, the same thing goes maybe not so much for Bojack Horseman, because that's more of a prestige exercise for Netflix and it brings in value by bringing in Netflix subscribers but they're all meant to sell you something but the big difference is that in the modern era we have this auteur driven cartoon industry which I just as a kid of the 90s I never thought would be possible where people get to try and tell personal stories where they get to try and tackle difficult emotional issues where they get to try and actually explore what the medium of animation can really do what it can be used to do the kinds of stories the kind of fantasies that they can tell that no other medium can ever do this is why I like Amazing World of Gumball so much like the shit that they try with the medium of animation it is profoundly impressive Amazing World of Gumball has some episodes that should be entered into the like the annals of animation history as just incredible uses of their medium to deliver the message. Even if the message is like funny, funny meme jokes and shit like that, it's not... We are in such a better place now. 
we are in the cartooning and animation is in such a better place now. And you don't have to like the new she cartoon. Maybe it's gonna be crap, I don't know. Maybe it's gonna be shitty. Maybe it's gonna run for one season and then not get a second season and no one's gonna care about it in six months. That's what happened to Thund uh, Thundercats 2011. It ran for like a couple of seasons and then nobody cared about it ever again. Maybe that's gonna happen. Because that also happens sometimes. Or turd-driven projects aren't gar guaranteed to succeed. Like, serious-minded projects trying to do something incredible with the medium of cartooning aren't guaranteed to succeed. And I'm not sure she will succeed. Like, it looks very pretty, but who knows? It could be a giant pile of doo-doo. I don't know. I don't care that much if this one cartoon does well or does poorly. But I do care that people don't somehow manage to trick themselves into thinking that this bullshit... This bullshit right here. This bullshit right... What the hell is that? I, the only reason I've got this image in this slideshow at all is because this character design is so profoundly baffling to me. What the fuck is this? What the hell is she supposed to be? It's the, I looked it up on the wiki, right? It's this character over here. She's a witch, and she's old, and she has some powerful magic spells, but she keeps forgetting about them, and she has a talking broom that she rides around on. How the... What the, how the fuck is this supposed to exist within the same visual universe as this? What the fuck is this thing? Who the hell is that? Why does any of this fit together? And the answer, of course, is because no one gives a fucking shit on the production of this goddamn cartoon. They just want some shit they can turn into toys and market to children. That's why it looks so completely and utterly bizarre and out of place. But it's just, like, this character design has been haunting me, man. It's been haunting me. It's so bad and wrong. Like, Orko at least has this black mage charm kind of thing going on with it but what the hell is this abomination anyway don't let yourself get blinded by nostalgic glasses into thinking that this is a more interesting character design than that that this is a more interesting character design than that that this is <laughs> Good lord. Is a more interesting and valuable character. What the fuck is up with that mustache character design than this? Like, I believe, actually, I mean, I may be wrong about this, but as far as I recall, in the original lore of the He-Man universe, like, He-Man and She-Ra are supposed to be, like, 16 years old. Uh, anyway, the point I was trying to get at, which I've been trying to get at a couple of times now, it's like, don't... Don't don't do revisionism like that. It pisses me off and it's disrespectful. Like I think it's really disrespectful to all the effort that so many great creative people made over so many years to get us away from this bullshit. To make this not be what cartoons look like anymore. To make this naked, ugly, just mismatched, completely blatant, cynical cash grab not be the status quo of animation anymore. Don't harken back to that. Don't be nostalgic for that for any other reason except that you were a kid back then and you didn't know any better. It's just don't. They were not good cartoons. You are allowed to like them. There's nothing wrong with liking them, but you don't delude yourself into thinking that just because you don't understand why She-Ra looks like this right now, that means that this nonsense was better. Anyway, this has been a bit of an angry rant extended, and if you have already tuned out from this a very long time ago, I do not blame you in the least. However, if you did like this video, somehow, then there is a like button down below that you can click, and if you are uh, so inclined, I do have... Uh, you can also subscribe, by the way, and if you are so inclined, I do a Patreon. If you want to help me make more of these videos, then any dollar that you have that you don't need will help me do that. Or, if you want me to stop making videos like this, and you'd prefer I make videos about literally anything else, then you can also support the Patreon with like a dollar or two, and if you put some suggestions on the Patreon, I will listen to them a lot more than I listen to people down in the comments, because because you've given me a dollar, and that makes me listen to you more, because I'm a sellout. <clears throat> But if you don't, of course, that is completely okay. There's also a dislike button down below, which you are very free to avail yourself of. But if you, if you press it, there's a 1 in 665,000 chance that the cartoon or the media property that you like the most is going to get bought by EA, turned into a crappy mobile video game, and then just fall off the map forever as they refuse to sell it and refuse to do anything with it ever again. God bless you, Command and Conquer. You were too good for this world. Thank you very much for watching.